your outcomes in life are often a lagging measure of your habits. You know, like a lot of the time people talk about, you know, I want to have more money or I want to lose weight or I want some kind of result. But the truth is your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your knowledge is a lagging measure of your learning and reading habits. And so it's actually, we think the thing that needs to change is the bank account or the test score or the number on the scale, but actually the thing that needs to change are the habits that precede those outcomes. Right. It's not that luck and randomness and uncertainty don't play a role in life. They do. You know, luck, luck is a part of all of our lives to a certain degree, both good fortune and bad. But by definition, you don't have control over luck. And your habits also matter. And I think that the reason they're so worthwhile uh, to focus on and understand is that they are the portion of your life that you can influence that also determines your outcomes. It's not just luck, it's not just habits, but one of those you have control over. And so it makes sense the only reasonable strategy is to focus on what you can control. If you spend all of your time focusing on things you can't control, then you're just gonna end up frustrated. And so I think habits are maybe the best lever for that. And um, it's important, you know, people have natural uh, predispositions to things that make them better. But what you find is that nearly always when someone is a great performer in a particular domain, they are both well suited, so naturally talented or have some kind of predisposition to that area, and well trained. And so even if you are talented, you can't succeed without having great habits to, to execute and to fully realize the potential that you have. Every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And if you can master the right actions, if you can master the right habits, then you can start to cast votes for this new identity, this desired person that you want to be. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why small habits matter so much they don't necessarily transform your life overnight, right, right away. Like doing one push-up does not transform your body, but it does cast a vote for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Or meditating for one minute might not give you an immediate sense of calm in your life, but it does cast a vote for being a meditator. The real goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. The goal is not to write a book. The goal is to become a writer. Because once you've adopted that identity, you're really not even pursuing behavior change anymore. You're just kind of acting in alignment with the type of person you already see yourself to be. It's kind of like true behavior change is really identity change. Because once you've changed that internal story, it's way easier to show up each day. You're not even really motivating yourself that much to do it. You're just like, this is who I am now. The technical definition of a habit is a behavior that has been repeated enough times to be more or less automatic. So things that you can do pretty much without thinking about them. Uh, unplugging your toaster after each use, or tying your shoes, or um, brushing your teeth. Things that you pretty much just go on autopilot when you do them. Why does the brain build them? What, what role does it play? Well, as you go through life, uh, you need energy to survive. And this is true not just for humans, but for all organisms need some kind of energy to survive. And getting energy, uh, requires energy. You need to eat food to be able to walk around and find the next meal. Um, and using energy is expensive because the more energy you use, the less you have available for the other things that life throws at you. And so your brain is looking for ways to conserve energy, to conserve energy whenever possible. And habits are a great method for doing that. It's like an algorithm that you can rely on. It's a cognitive script, a mental shortcut that you can pull out whenever the situation is right. And that's true not just for things like finding food, which is essential for our survival, but also for daily tasks, because all these daily tasks take energy as well. So something like tying your shoes, your brain learns the context of when I have a shoe on my foot and the shoestring is untied, that means I do this little routine where I tie the, the shoe and shoelace into a knot and so on. And the first time you do it, it takes energy, and then, but after you do it 100 times or 1,000 times or 10,000 times, pretty soon you're doing it just like turning right at the tree, you can have a conversation with somebody else or listen to a podcast or think about your to-do list for the day. You free up that energy and attention to be used elsewhere. And you have, this is perhaps the biggest thing that they do, you have less wasted energy. Rather than fumbling with the laces and trying hard to do it, you can do it more quickly and fluently and that saves you energy and time for the next task. So that's why your brain builds them um, and what a habit does. And then as far as why I got interested in them, um, I started to realize, similar to what I hinted at a moment or two ago, that both luck and habits play a role in life, 
but that you have control over your habits. And the funny thing is, we're building them all the time, but a lot of people don't feel like they have control over their habits. They feel like their habits are taking control of them, that they're like a victim of these bad routines. And once you start to dive in a little bit and like uncover the layers uh, and realize what a habit is and how it works, then you start to develop a little more control over it. And I think if we're gonna be building habits anyway, then it makes more sense to be able to understand how they work and how to structure them so that uh, you can be the architect of your habits rather than the victim of them. Well, so just a quick story that I like that I feel like illustrates the point. Um, so we're in uh, the UK and uh, for many years, the British cycling team was very mediocre. Uh, they had never won a Tour de France, uh, even though the race had been around over 100 years. They had won, I think, a single gold medal back in 1908. And so uh, they brought in this new performance director, 2003, 2004, and he believed in this concept that he called the aggregation of marginal gains. And so he described it as like the 1% improvement in all the areas related to cycling. And so they started by making 1% improvements that uh, other teams were probably looking at too. Put slightly lighter tires on the bike. They had their riders wear these electrically heated over shorts to keep their, their legs warm so they could ride for longer. Um, they uh, had um, different biofeedback sensors that each rider would wear and then they adjusted the programs to each individual. But again, competitive field, a lot of teams are doing that. So then they did a bunch of 1% changes that nobody else was thinking about. Like they hired a surgeon to come in and teach them how to wash their hands to reduce the risk of catching a cold or getting a flu. Um, they split tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the fastest form of muscle recovery. They, uh, they even figured out the type of pillow and mattress that led to the best night's sleep for each rider. And then they brought that on the road with them to big events like when they were at hotels for the Tour de France and things like that. And so uh, Brailsford said, all right, if we can, the coach said, if we can actually do this, right, execute on all these little 1% changes, then I think we can win a Tour de France within five years. So they did, in fact, execute on all these little changes and they won the Tour de France not in five years, but in three years. And then they repeated again the fourth year with a different rider. And then after one year off, they've now won the last three in a row again. So they've won five of the last six now after having never won it for more than 100 years. I bring that story up uh, not because um, I think, you know, cycling is the perfect example or anything, but just because it's a good story that showcases the power of being committed to making those small improvements each day. And uh, I think that it's not just nice to have, it's not just like a little cherry on top of your performance to make these 1% changes, but they actually can compound and add up in a really significant way in the long run. And habits are a lot like that. They're, they're not exactly like compound interest, you know, where you kind of like hit that hockey stick portion of the curve, but they really feel like that a lot. You know, like we were saying just a few moments ago, it feels insignificant on any day, but then you turn around 10 years later and it's actually, you're surprised by where you end up. And that's a hallmark of any compounding process, that the greatest returns are delayed. And so uh, habits are like that too. You know, they, they don't feel like much on any given day, but they really add up over the months and years. There is a sort of an, uh, a misalignment of rewards that often happens with habits. So there's an immediate outcome, an immediate reward, and then an ultimate reward. And for your bad habits, one reason bad habits stick so readily that they, they form so easily is because bad habits, often the immediate reward is favorable, right? Like what's the immediate reward of eating a donut? It's kind of great. It's sweet, it's sugary, it tastes good. It's only the ultimate reward if you repeat that habit for six months or a year or two years that is unfavorable. Meanwhile, good habits are often the exact opposite. The immediate reward of going to the gym or going to the gym for like a week isn't really that great. Your body's probably sore. Uh, you don't have much to show for it. Your body looks the same. Your weight hasn't really changed. But it's, if you stick to that for six months or a year or two years, then the ultimate reward is favorable. And so a lot of the balance uh, or a lot of the challenge of building good habits and breaking bad ones is figuring out how to pull the long-term costs of your bad habits into the present moment so you feel a little bit of that pain right now and have a reason to avoid it and pull the long-term rewards of your good habits into the present moment so it feels good and you have a reason to kind of make it through that like valley of death in the beginning and stick with it while you're waiting for those delayed rewards to accumulate. I think we could just summarize that whole uh, cognitive bias or mismatch, uh, misalignment of rewards by saying the cost of your good habits is in the present and the cost of your bad habits is in the future. 
And the fact that we prioritize the present over the future ends up making a lot of habit change difficult for that reason.